Hey gearheads and welcome to Garage Talk. I'm Corey and this is the first brand new Dodge vehicle in a decade. This is the new Dodge Hornet compact utility vehicle and Dodge in partnerships with Alfa Romeo have made this quite a compelling package with only one real rival in the industry and that's the Mazda CX-5. How does this thing stack up? Stay tuned to find out. First of all, gearheads, I do want to say a huge thanks to Dodge for bringing this to us to review for you. We've had it for a full week. We've had a lot of fun in it, but let's talk about what this vehicle is. Yes, I did mention Alfa Romeo. This being the first brand new Dodge in a decade is actually made in Italy at an Alfa Romeo facility. And when we get inside, you will definitely see all the Alfa Romeo influences. This shares a body structure with the new Tonale uh, from Alfa Romeo, but Dodge assures us that everything with the powertrain and suspension is unique to Dodge, which does bring us to what is underneath the hood here, because we have the base GT model and uh, this one is actually a more premium GT Plus. But as we open the hood here, first I wanna point out that there is no prop rod. We actually have uh, gas struts that hold this in place, which is a very nice touch if you ask me, especially in this segment. But the powertrain in our GT model is a two liter Hurricane 4 turbocharged four cylinder. Go figure. It does make a pretty astonishing 268 horsepower and 295 pound-feet of torque. And Dodge is claiming this as the industry's fastest and most powerful gas-powered compact utility vehicle. And they're not too far off with that claim. The Mazda CX-5 that I referenced earlier is really the only main competitor to this. And its base model makes 187 horsepower and 185 pound-feet of torque. You have to get their up-level turbo engine uh, to get anywhere close to this with 256 horsepower, which is a little less, and 310 pound-feet of torque, which is a little more. All Dodge Hornets are all-wheel drive. So yes, this is a front-wheel drive-based platform, as you can tell by the layout of that engine, uh, but it is an all-wheel drive uh, configuration mated to a nine-speed automatic transmission. All this is good for what Dodge claims is a six and a half second zero to 60 run. We'll see that in a little bit. And this actually has a higher top speed at 140 miles per hour than the faster new for 2024 RT plug-in hybrid version. Now, when we close the hood of this, this is where we actually see a lot of the benefits of partnering with Alfa Romeo. Again, the body shell is shared with the Alfa Romeo Tonali, which is a stunningly beautiful compact utility vehicle, but you can see the face on this is very distinctly Dodge, taking some cues, softening it up a little bit from the uh, Charger big a full-size American sedan, but for 2024, this really is the future of the Dodge brand. The Durango is on borrowed time. The Charger and Challenger are officially gone in the 24 model year. So if you want a 2024 Dodge, it's this or an aging Durango, which like I said, is on borrowed time. We're yet to see what that actually brings, but this definitely has some distinct Dodge cues on it. Starting up here on the hood, no, these are not fake. These are actually functional heat extractors on the hood that do let hot air out of the engine bay from that little turbocharged four cylinder. And then we get that distinctly Dodge look up front with those kind of hockey puck style running lights and turn signals, all LED lights up here, very nice. This is the first vehicle to be designed with the new Dodge logo, and that is those dual hash marks. And it gives a nice clean look, but we'll leave some kind of confused as to exactly what this vehicle is if you're not used to or familiar with that new Dodge logo. I will knock it just a little bit here because these are fake. Uh, we don't actually allow air to float around the front corner of the vehicle. That is a slight knock for me. 
but as we get around to the side here, you can see we've got the track package on our model, which uh, upgrades the wheels from the GT's 17 inch to the GT Plus with the track package, 20 inch black wheels uh, with Brembo with Brembo brakes, that's harder to say than I thought it would be, all wrapped in Michelin 23540ZR20 inch Pilot Sport all season tires. These tires are actually really good and I kind of thought they'd be overkill, but uh, so far they've put a very big smile on my face. Pulling out from it, yes, we've got the Acapulco Gold, which is slightly controversial. I've had uh, some friends and family call it Baby Doo Doo Yellow. You make your own uh, distinctions on that, but I've intentionally not washed this after our full week of testing, which it has driven through rain and all kinds of stuff. And you can see it hides dirt really well. So that is one benefit to this color. Another is that it's just striking. It really sets the vehicle off uh, when you're driving around town because uh, the Alpha has a very distinct front end front grille with that triangular uh, front grille up front. This is a little more generic crossover SUV and has a little less flair to distinguish it from a lot of the other crossovers on the market. In fact, uh, my wife and I daily a 2014 Jeep Cherokee Trailhawk, and there are some very similar design lines, even with, uh, within the Stellantis family, uh, from a vehicle that was designed over a decade ago. So there is that. Coming around to the side, you can see, uh, again, very nondescript, nothing too spectacular design-wise here, but we do get black plastic lower cladding, which does give the vehicle a little more of a raised SUV look. In addition to our black top GT track package, we do get this blacked out Dodge Hornet on the side that is uh, prepared to sting, which is a really cool look and really again sets this vehicle apart and as we move to the back door here I do want to show you uh, a very distinct Alfa Romeo design cue and that is the cutout uh, of this rear window into the body itself again this is a shared body platform with that Alfa Romeo Tonali and we saw the same design uh, language design feature on the bigger Stelvio that we drove earlier this year as well coming around back to the back again very familiar uh, dodge style here but also very familiar crossover style but we do get all led lighting back here led brake lights turn signals and this led light bar that actually runs all the way across the back it looks like our headlights have turned off on us so i'm going to go ahead and pop in here make sure we are turned on so you can see exactly what the LED light bar looks like across the back because that Dodge emblem also lights up there in the middle. Really cool look, really kind of sets this thing apart at night. And one of my favorite things that we also saw on something very expensive in a Lexus LC is the kind of light tunnel that is created by multiple LED elements that kind of gives it this um, mirror upon mirror look going down into where the actual tail lights and turn signals reside. It's a pretty cool, very upscale look for the back end of this rather affordable crossover. Coming back to the back, we do have a power lift gate, uh, but the button is really low and is probably going to get dirty on you uh, as you drive through muck and disgustingness. Opening up the rear hatch, uh, calling back to that Mazda CX-5 we talked about earlier. Most crossovers in this segment are just vastly more roomy back here in the back, but this competes not only on a performance and price level with that CX-5, but also on a cargo space uh, level with that Mazda CX-5. Being that the RT is a plug-in hybrid, there has to be some room for batteries, so RT numbers will be slightly less than this, but this GT model gets 27 cubic feet of cargo space back here behind the rear seats, and 54.7 if you fold those 60-40 split bench seats down. The Mazda gets slightly more rear cargo space at 29.1, with the seats up and 59.1 with the seats down. But to make the most 
of the cargo space here in this Hornet. You are going to have to remove this hard parcel shelf, which again, is not my favorite. I don't know why so many automakers uh, are using these. I really like the retractable kind. You'll also have to move the load floor down here to its lower position, which is a little easier when you don't have things already sitting in it. But you can see we can drop this down a considerable amount uh, to get more vertical space, but that takes away your flush load in back here, as well as your flush load in to the fold down of your rear seats back there. But underneath here, no spare tire. You can option a spare tire, but ours came with a fix a flat kit and that's where all your tools uh, will be located uh, for fixing a flat, changing a flat. But you can see fairly decent amount of space back here, but nothing uh, class leading by any means. This is a very un-Dodge like rear hatch, un Stellantis like rear hatch because I actually put the button to close it on the hatch itself. Many other Stellantis products do uh, put it somewhere here on the side. So that is something to note. And there is actually one more thing I do want to show you about the uh, cargo floor here that I'm going to have to remove all my stuff just to show you. So uh, not only do we have the adjustable floor here, but if we put it back in its uh, most upright position, uh, you can lift it up and it will stay in place with these little retractable levers here. So you can get in and underneath it. So if you've got it in its raised position, want to store some stuff where it won't be seen, you can do that very easily, just like that. Me at 510, this is how much room I've got under the hatch. It fits in our garage and opens without hitting anything. All around, it is a very usable hatch design. I just wish the button were on the side like many other Stellantis products. All right, before we get into this one, I did want to show you the key, typical Dodge key, very similar to products that they've had for over 10 years. It says Dodge on it. You can remove a physical key. We've got lock, unlock, hatch release, panic button, and remote start. It is a proximity key, so you can keep it in your pocket, in your purse, wherever you do keep your keys. The front doors do have passive entry, so you can unlock it by pushing or touching the back of the door handle, lock it by pushing that button right there. Locking it that way does fold your mirrors in. Unlocking it doesn't unfold your mirrors. Those don't actually move until you start the vehicle. And as we currently have this one configured, unlocking that way does not unlock all four doors. So for those safety conscious people out there, uh, just wanted to call that out. Coming to the doors before we climb inside, you can see the interior it very heavily borrows from Alfa Romeo and looks kind of unlike any other Dodge product that is currently on the market. We've got a three person memory and uh, driver seat, uh, which is a very Alfa Romeo thing here. You've got lock and unlock from the Alfa as well. We've got a Harman Kardon sound system here. And then we've got some um, eh, metallic accents here as well. Very interesting plastic texture here though. I, I like how it's not gloss black, please don't put gloss black. Uh, there's actually no gloss black in this one in major touch points, which I really like. You do get your uh, mirror controls with the power fold button right here. All four windows are express up, down. Huge kudos to Dodge on that for carrying that over. And then you do get a window lockout here. Not a lot of storage in the door themselves. There's a little bit right here and a little down there. Coming to the side, again, we do have the track package, so we get the up-level seats with eight-way position uh, memory seats and four-way lumbar. That is a really nice touch. Uh, that is on both front seats, but the passenger seat uh, is not a uh, driver or a memory does not have memory. There we go. You get Hornet here on the sill plate. And then I really do like the design of these seats. They are wrapped in Alcantara with some red inserts. I don't know if the red clashes with the gold on the outside, but how typically are you seeing both the inside and the outside at the same time? Plus, you know, red is traditionally the sporty color. Coming into the headrest, you can see we get that Dodge logo uh, embroidered there on the headrest as well. It's a nice look. They are a sporty seat that is a design from Alfa Romeo, 
which is a nice touch. We do get a little Easter egg hornet here on the side as well. That is also on the passenger side when you open the door. Coming in to the vehicle and closing the door, now would be a good time to talk about all of the noises that this vehicle makes because it is distinctly Alfa Romeo. And well, let's just go ahead and start it up. So you get Alfa Romeo chimes. And then even the engine sounds unlike any Turbo 4 that we've sampled here lately. So Dodge has done a little work to make it sound a little bit more aggressive. You do get this 12 inch uh, Alfa Romeo binocular style gauge cluster with a reverse sweeping tachometer that you can see there. But yeah, uh, while we're still on the topic of noises, we have a very alpha turn signal. And it doesn't click and stay into place either. So that is just something to note. Uh, it, it always defaults to the middle, just interesting. And the last really alpha thing here are the door locks. So when you unlock it, it is very clunky. So just some interesting alpha quirks that have made their way into this. This does share all interior components and mechanicals uh, or uh, software with Dodge or, or with the Alpha because it is built in Italy alongside that Alfa Romeo Tonali. So again, that binocular style uh, gauge cluster is very Alpha as is the 10 and a quarter inch Uconnect 5 system, but we'll get into that as we work our way across. Starting over my left knee, we get all our light controls right here uh, with a dial for turning them on. No fog lights on this one. You do get a kind of uh, spring-loaded adjustment here for your brightness control, and your hatch button is down here. The auto start-stop button in an Alpha is typically up here, but they've actually moved it underneath the vehicle start button, so uh, that's an, an interesting movement of uh, sorts. We do get some knot leather and some fake stitching here that gives it just a little bit of a sporty appearance. I like the differentiation in textures, but it is kind of a hard plastic. Up here, this is one area where this vehicle has creaked and made some interior noise for me. It is a softer injection molded plastic, but our 2014 Jeep Cherokee has a nicer material for the upper dash. And then we get a little bit of gloss plastic here, as well as a little bit around all the other HVAC controls. Coming across to the steering wheel, this is an Alpha steering wheel. We've got uh, leather wrapped with some perforations where your grips are. It's a nice, very sporty feeling steering wheel. You've got that Dodge emblem there. Alphas normally put your engine start stop button here, but we get a sport button, which is one of two ways to defeat the engine start stop fe feature. One is by pushing this very obvious button right here. The other is putting it into sport mode, which changes all your gauges. We'll talk about that here in just a moment. But all the controls here, very unlike any Dodge uh, that we've sampled, as with the controls on the backs on the two stalks back here. So if you're familiar with modern Stellantis products and have not driven an Alfa Romeo, this is going to be a little bit foreign to you just because, well, it's a little bit foreign. On this side, we get your uh, phone control button, your uh, mode button here for your screen, your multi-positional roller dial here that in its default mode is your tuning or your track change, and then volume buttons here. There are no uh, controls on the back of the steering wheel like other Stellantis products. So these are your radio controls uh, as they currently sit. Now, if you hit this button right here, it actually goes to the center screen and you can page through uh, with one press what is on the main screen. And you can see we can do a di few different things here from uh, the digital speedometer, the map, your performance gauges, your driver assist, things like that. Press it again and you can change what is in the middle of your tachometer, which includes uh, your tire pressure, some more performance stuff, uh, or you can just leave it blank 
You can also put a compass in there and uh, the music that you're currently listening to. I like to have it on the trip computer. Seems relevant for that information. And then if you leave it alone long enough, it goes back to your track change or your station change. On this side, you've got all your uh, driver uh, assistance tech, your uh, lane centering, your gap adjust, your speed, uh, sp your cruise control, your speed set for your cruise control, and the different modes for that cruise control. So you can do just a normal cruise control or radar adaptive. Coming back to the turn signal stocks, your lane assist is actually here on the side of this turn signal stock. Actually, I had to press it twice to tr truly turn off lane sense, but press it once to turn it back on. Over here are all your wiper controls. You do have automatic wipers in this model. Uh, your miss button is here on the end, but to access or to toggle that rear right wiper, can't talk, you push it down and that does that. So that is a quick in-depth look at all your driver controls up here. Moving over to the 10 and a quarter inch Uconnect system. There are some gremlins in the software of this vehicle, one of which is something we experienced just last night. We drove home, the headlights automatically turned on. We got in the garage, we turned it off, and it was warning us in the gauge cluster that the headlights were on, even though we were in automatic here and could do nothing about it. And it just kept binging at us, telling us that the headlights were on, even though there was nothing we could do about it. Ah! just gremlins. This is a hybrid between Dodge and Alfa Romeo, neither of which are just overly um, well received with uh, within the internet car culture for their reliability. And that's just a small gremlin we found. Also, this has proven to be just a little laggy for us as we kind of go through different things as you can see there I was just trying to select media there have been a few times like going in through the uh, climate controls trying to turn on my heated seat and stuff that I've just found it to be slightly laggy which is not very typical of Uconnect systems and is just been slightly frustrating here in this one but as with many Uconnect systems you can customize what is up here across the top I really like how uh, this does have the, your 360 cameras they are crisp and clear the resolution of the screen works very nicely and you can see we get lots of different camera angles here in this one you can turn that off simply by doing that unfortunately because a lot of the stuff including the heated seats and steering wheel are contained here within the, uh, the screen itself. If you put it in reverse, you're not gonna be turning your heated seat or heated steering wheel on until you put it back in park. So just a, a minor annoyance that is something that we deal with daily in our 2014 Jeep as well. Moving down from here, we get very alpha uh, HVAC controls. It is dual, uh, dual zone automatic climate control, so I really like that. Uh, you just change your temperature by pushing up and down here. Very nice touch. We do get some power back here. We get a 12 volt cigarette lighter style plug in there, a USB-A, USB-C, and a wireless charger that fits my iPhone 14 Pro Max, but really just heats it up and gets it hot. Not my favorite. I do like how it's pointed at you, so if my phone were charging here, uh, I could actually see when notifications pop up or something on it, or just see a picture of my kid, but not my favorite implementation because it really kills your interior storage space, of which there isn't a whole lot. We get a couple cup holders here and a rather small center console, the back of which is uh, taken up by the fact that there are HVAC vents on the back here. So not a lot of storage up front here. Another gripe I have, so this is my eye line right here. If I were to put this in drive, I cannot see the only volume knob uh, for the uh, entertainment system here. So that is my only volume knob. Again, I do have the buttons up here, but if I want to quickly change the volume, I'm going to be rolling that knob. And if I put this in drive, can't see it, just slight annoyance. You can push it to completely mute it. That's nice. Electronic parking brake, your parking sensors and your traction control buttons are all right here. But that really is all of the front seat controls. Front seat comfort is very nice. Again, I really like these seats. Headroom is pretty good. We have the head, uh, the sunroof delete option in this. So we do get a little bit of a cutout for our uh, front seat passengers up here. 
all around rather nice, but it does make it incredibly dark in here. I really, really wish uh, we had the sunroof in this one, but we did save on the window sticker 500 some five hundred dollars and some change so really wish we had a sunroof but other than that no big complaint here now let's check out that back seat and see how that compares uh sitting behind myself here at 510. all right coming up to the back door you do have to unlock it from the front door just because like i showed you earlier uh, the passive entry does not unlock the back doors how we currently have our set but you can see here the back doors open wide enough if you want to see what it's like uh, installing a child safety seat be sure and subscribe because we've got a family review coming up hard plastics back here more of that textured plastic right here and then a very small window switch button here but again it is expressed up and down the seats themselves do not slide forward and backward they are fixed in place but they are 60 40 split and we still get that alcantara with all the red accents we'll chuck flynn over to the seat over there i did want to show you they don't recline uh, but they do fold unfortunately with tucker's child safety seat in there it's not going to fold down completely for us but we do get top tethers all the way across that's a nice touch and got to make sure your seat belt doesn't get stuck back behind them but let's pop in behind myself at 510 and see what it's like sitting in here so I'm comfortable. I'm not touching the seat in front of me. I've got plenty of foot space back here. Interestingly enough, even in its second model year, you cannot find interior measurements on the internet. I've looked, I've looked on uh, both the customer facing Dodge site and the media site, cannot get interior measurements on this, but it does seem slightly smaller than our Jeep Cherokee does. Uh, in fact, that is something Tucker has commented on. You can see just how much we've got that front passenger seat scooted up. It is on the small side. I, I will not deny that. And unfortunately, it, it's just, a compact utility vehicle that's what you get in this class but we do get map pockets on the backs of both front seats we do get some air vents back here with a close uh, button right here or knob right here and then we get a usb a and usb c port back here as well which is a nice touch and we get a fold down center armrest with two cup holders i guess phone storage and because it is an alpha a pass through to the trunk area that actually folds into the trunk area. Again, this being built in Italy alongside the Tonali. This is an Alpha inside. It uses Italian source products and does a lot of part sharing, especially here on the inside. But how does this Italian born Dodge actually drive and perform? And is it better than that Mazda CX-5 out on the road? Let's hop back behind the steering wheel and see. Okay, before we completely set off in this one, I do want to show you some fun things. We'll go into vehicle. We'll go into vehicle. Again, very glitchy. And then we can go into performance and we get some performance gauges here that shows you our turbo uh, boost and our torque there on the gauge. And then I'm going to go ahead and put this in sport mode, which does change a little bit here on the gauge cluster. Instead of highlighting the numbers as the needles sweep across uh, the speedometer and the tack, this highlights them in their totality and allows me to see a little bit more of what's going on. Whereas in normal drive mode, which it defaults to every time you start the vehicle, you don't get that. It just highlights the numbers as it sweeps across. So just a couple of interesting notes. This thing does ride a little bit firm, but again, it is a sport crossover. And we're gonna do a quick little acceleration here. Again, uh, Dodge claims a six and a half second zero to 60 here in the GT. We're gonna brake torque it just a little bit and go. Yes, this thing is fun and fast and 60. It, it will scoot and has been a very fun vehicle in our time with it. And to show you just how good the brakes are on this, we'll do some hard braking at 65 miles per hour. Oh, oh. Woof. <laughs> The universal symbol of fun times ahead. This 
This really is my favorite driving road. And for a crossover to put such a smile on my face really says a lot. Not only is the steering sport tuned very quick and fun without being overly heavy, uh, the brakes do a great job of very linearly slowing this vehicle down. Uh, given that we have the track package, we do have those up level Brembo brakes um, that really do a great job of slowing us down and give you a little more confidence barreling into corners in this thing. But <laughs> I, I can only think of one other crossover that puts this much of a smile on my face going down roads like this. And that is that Mazda CX-5, maybe that Mazda CX-50 that may or may not replace it very soon. This really is the only main competitor to that when it comes to sportiness, driving, excitement, and fun. So in a world just full of crossovers where it seems like we're getting a new one every single day, yes, Toyota, I am looking at you. This one is actually fun. It is done the very Dodge way of doing things. And while, yes, uh, we're seeing the end of the big V8 powered uh, muscle cars from Dodge and leaning into crossovers, they are at least fun crossovers. So that is a slight benefit, I guess. But yes, we are going to miss the crazy Hellcat powered vehicles that we've thoroughly enjoyed testing uh, here on the channel. The CX-5 is very fast, fun and sporty, has a lot of torque, but it you have to option the turbo engine, whereas this base model gets a turbocharged engine. So that's a nice touch, way more power than the base CX-5. We also get three more gears. The CX-5 only has an archaic six-speed automatic where this gets a nine-speed. And in sport mode, it shifts rather quickly and it kind of gives you a little kick in the pants every time it goes through the gears during hard acceleration. The steering, the transmission, the engine, everything on this is uniquely Dodge, and they will emphasize that over and over again. Although this being an Alfa Romeo, at its core, is still a very solid vehicle when it comes to performance and driving character and driving fun. I very much enjoyed my time in the Stelvio. I have yet to drive the Tonale, uh, but this Hornet has proven to be a lot of fun, especially for what is essentially a base model. I, I've enjoyed long trips in this. Uh, you can tell there is a little bit of kind of harsh road noise, especially on this highly textured uh, East Texas pavement. For the most part, it is what you would expect from a vehicle starting at $30,000. This one, as it is optioned, is just over $40,000. Again, we've got the track pack and all that fun stuff on it. But uh, yeah, good on long trips, seats are nice and comfortable, and then it is really fun uh, when you get on a curvy back road. So this definitely handles unlike many other crossovers in this segment. Again, its only real competition would be that Mazda CX-5. This very much is the dodge of compact crossovers, and that cannot be emphasized more than just getting out and having some fun on this one. I did reference earlier, there are some creaks and rattles in here. Everything I'm hearing right now is either road noise or from my uh, kid's child seat back there in the back. But the dash does kind of creak on textured pavement and rough roads just a little bit. But otherwise, this is a very nice, fun, solid crossover from Dodge and Alfa Romeo and has made a big smile on my face and quite the impression in my week's worth of testing here. This is absolutely a market disruptor because again, in a world full of crossovers, uh, Dodge is entering the fray with something that very much fits with its brand identity. No, it doesn't have a large fire breathing V8 under the hood really can't do in this segment, but it does everything else very well. It is very fun to drive, 
take around corners, and you can definitely sense those Alfa Romeo roots here in the Dodge Hornet. If ever there was a brand for Dodge to partner with within Stellantis, it would be Alfa Romeo. Time will only tell how these hold up over time because we have seen lots of reports uh, from early test models kind of suffering a little bit in the reliability department. But being as this is one of the best selling segments in the entire business, Dodge really can't afford for this one to go wrong. So you know they will put all their time, energy, and effort into perfecting this as it goes over time. Unfortunately, that is all for me here in my solo performance review of this Dodge Hornet GT. Uh, if you want to see more from us, you can find us on all social media channels and platforms at GT Garage Talk, Facebook, Instagram, X, uh, Threads, TikTok, YouTube, everything at GT Garage Talk, or you can go to GTGarageTalk.com. But as for me, <laughs> behind the wheel of the Dodge Hornet GT, which is a base model. I'm just having a lot of fun at carving these corners back here. Until next time, gearheads. Bye. This engine pulls, uh, you can slap it over into manual mode and row through the eight gears yourself uh, with minus being forward and plus being pulling back uh, but I really lament no paddles on the back of the steering wheel that really is something I kind of expected to see especially in a Dodge <laughs>